Well, I've never remarked the last name, but um, uh, Professor um, Merrick, you? Um, just an observation. Uh, you produced the figures from the Heritage Foundation of been taken off over our friends in the Is this absolutely correct? Because it seems to me that one, uh, certainly if you look quite high at both the time, the quite high in Elizabethan times, um, if you're just going to go on um, uh, monetary, uh, perhaps there is so but on all sides of the I'd say that uh, this is one incorrect. And two, if I may make an observation, uh, you have taken the uh, form of capitalism of, um, of markets, of um, what well, you, the way you've laid it down. But I would make an observation that capitalism at the present moment is more corporatism and it isn't your model of capitalism that is actually in the world today and is actually uh, going around. Uh, that's all thanks. Yes, we just hired, yes, people. Two points there, can I quickly? Um, I should point out that the first figure that I used was actually not from the Heritage Foundation. It's from Marcus Manson, who used to work at the OECD. Um, I'll just put it down quickly so I can show you. Uh, this is basically a uh, um, um, compendium of lots of different studies. But Angus Manson is probably the leading economic historian in the world. And you know, he's a professor of economics at somewhere in Sweden, I forget the exact university. And this is from peer reviewed journal articles. I mean, this is statistically robust. Um, and <coughs> it could well be true that there may be some tiny little uh, points upwards in there. But I think it's so significant that it wouldn't really show. So, again, I mean, I've got some research myself. I mean, as an academic, I take stuff from peer reviewed journal articles. And because that's past the same standard, I assume that's fairly accurate. Until there's a study done that disproves it. So I mean, that's the way I have to work. I mean, I check. So for me, that study is robust. The Heritage Foundation study yeah, isn't peer reviewed. I mean, and I would certainly give less weight to that as one has to do. And your second point is a very fair point. Um, one of the difficulties of being prepared for this debate is that going on your website saying, uh, I believe I'm saying that you believe that all. So what I would call communist society or social society not being socialist. So it's very hard for me to know what the target is, if you like. Um, equally, I would probably not accept the definition of capitalism either. I think you're right. But, you know, the UK, for me, is it's a form of capitalism, clearly. But it's not a society that I want to defend in lots of ways. But, you know, one has to produce a workable presentation for you guys. So I have to work with what I've got, in a sense. So, yeah, I agree. I believe in free markets. You know, we're in a framework of government. You know, so what we have here is suboptimal from my, my point of view. Okay, next person. Uh, non-party number first. <laughs> Alright. Okay. Just a quick one, maybe to uh, avoid you taking you choking into my ears. I don't think they can hear you with that. So. Um, okay, um, alright, so just just for my sake and maybe to uh, you know, uh, avoid your utopianism on either side of the debate here, because you should just like, maybe start talking about the Labour theory of value. That's all I've got to say. What do you want to say about that? You tell me. <laughs> Gentlemen, I'm going to start a bit of interest. It occurs to me that you're, um, that John's talking really about the mechanics of society, where the socialism is all about the ethics and morals. But John points out to the fact that he um, believes they should want a minimum wage or you know, well, is anything that socialism in itself when it comes down to the fact that you, you, you care about people isn't cold and mechanical? I think just about that. Interest-bearing debt that's enslaving us all, irrespective of white, green, yellow, socialist, they were everybody, from cradle to grave. Unless you take control of the money supply system, you will not get anywhere. Number one. Number two, the credit assets, toxic assets, they're running at seven hundred trillion dollars. What it means is the whole of the world is bankrupt. 
is 50 times the GDP of the world. Any amount of quantitative easing is not going to clear that debt. This is the ideal time for us to bring in a new system where you introduce interest-free loans for productive capacity, get the money market out of the whole system. Because money is created out of nothing. Why should it be that compound interest should be charged on something created out of nothing? Do we have to pay for IR? You see, that's the crux of the whole thing. This is the assumption for the interest. <coughs> this is where every other system is interested. If I control the issue of the money supply, I cannot do righteous law. That's the government of the Bank of England. That was said in 18, 1684. We have been under that law all these years. Absolute failure on the free market here, absolute failure on everybody. Welcome. Can I resign for the purposes of speaking? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not an academic, so when I see a lot of material like this, I do struggle with it. Um, I'd like to make an observation, uh, not sorry, a question, and for response to an observation about the recession. <coughs> Firstly, from what I do know, demand is based on the ability to pay. So if you're starving and you've got no money, you can't buy any food. And if you're yeah. thirsty and you haven't got any money, then you can't drink the water because demand is based on the ability to pay. But I saw a more interesting thing, less interesting, but it's like this. Over the last few weeks, um, I keep turning on the news, turning on the TV, and I read my newspapers, and it tells us how worse everything is. I think there's been an attempt to pandemism, but because of the money for the banks instead of the uh, firms or the public, uh, public expenditure. And then we've suddenly got Russians all coming in, and what we've got is good money going off the bed. <coughs> so when I'm watching one of these programs, the news that's on uh, Channel 4 or whatever, um, it seems to me the start of all this was, was bankers lending money out um, to people who can't pay it back. This is a very raw analysis of it, and I'm sure there's a much more clever one. And then I, I see this on the TV, then there's a break in the news. There's an advert, and then it comes back on. And when those adverts are on, it says, we're targeting benefit fraud, right? We're targeting benefit fraud. So what I sort of know of this, I don't believe in benefit fraud. But it's possible that the people who are doing benefit fraud are probably very skilled people who are trying to add a bit of money to what they get from benefit by doing jobs on the side. The royal family. Well, the royal family as well. So my point <laughs> is, why does the system always target the people that are easiest to get? Why aren't some of these bankers being struck up? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you're basically you're talking about the free market economy as it applies to the entirety of society. Um, but the fact is, is that it just doesn't apply. The free market economy is basically for the punters. The the mechanism uh, for the punters. The mechanism that the uh, that. Uh, capitalism uses at the level of the state is the state. The mechanism is not the free market. You have like you have whole state departments uh, monitoring imports, and exports, regulating uh, the economy, uh, and they've done that for hundreds of years, yeah? just basically making sure that the thing works. Because the thing does not work without these uh, external inputs. What happens is that capitalism is the mechanism of exploitation. Capitalism is for us. Yeah. Capitalism is the way that we work in order only to get what we need, to get back through the door on Monday morning to work again, and a mechanism whereby we buy those products. Once the, once the uh, surplus has been exploited from us and gets to the level of the state, yeah, then it, as it is at the state level, yeah, the, that surplus is, is assigned. And that's why you have the different parties actually uh, uh, actually. Uh, uh, contributing to, to elections, saying, well, is it going to be manufacturing capital or interest capital or rent capital that is going to benefit out of this? Yeah. And they will all advertise, they will always all appeal to electorate, etc. And then on the basis of, uh, certainly in the, the free economy, rather than a managed economy where you'll decide what happens within the state, within the free economy, you have elections and like, you know, sections of the capitalist class will, will win or lose accordingly. 
Yeah, they'll basically put that to the electorate. As far as we're concerned, it doesn't matter. Yeah? So, when you're talking about whether socialism can work without capitalism, it's an irrelevant question. Yeah? Because what you're, uh, what, uh, what you're trying to say is you're trying to say is that the entire infrastructure of society cannot work without capitalism. Whereas what we would say is that most of the infrastructure of capitalism already works without capitalism. Yeah? It's only as it applies to us and milking us <coughs> that capitalism applies in its free market form. Everything else is just the same, uh, the same as before in pri uh, private society, uh, private ownership, whereby basically you accumulate a surplus at the level of the state and different interest groups fight for it. What we are saying is that we are going to make ourselves that interest group and we will assign that surplus. We will then turn around to the microeconomics of how we assign our lives and we will say, well, damn it, we're not going to be working for a wage anymore. But that does not mean the same kind of change that you're necessarily thinking. Yeah? It will certainly be a change as far as we're concerned, it would be fantastic. Yeah? But in terms of the way that society works, so, I mean, for example, the, the way that civil, uh, si uh, the civil service will work, I it won't be the same as that. This makes no sense to me at all. I just don't follow what you're saying. Sorry, it's not a carried item here. I don't wish to, you know, embarrass you about that. I mean, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, maybe you can rephrase it again for me then. I don't, I don't follow it at all. Would you allow me to rephrase? Please do. Quickly, though. Could you say that? Okay. I shall rephrase. Uh, I shall stand up and rephrase. What I'm saying is that capitalism works at the level of our uh, interaction with society as workers. Yeah? Basically, what is happening is that we go to work, we get a wage, we go to the shop, we spend our wages, we spend our wages for rent, spend our wages on mortgage, we go home, we live, we die. That's how capitalism works. However, what happens is that we work for a wage. Yeah? We work for the amount of money that it takes to, uh, to basically put us back through the factory door on a Monday morning, or the office door on a Monday morning, or whatever it is. Yeah? That's how much we work for. Enough basically to keep us alive so that uh, yeah, we mortgage our house when we're retired and we die with pennies in our pockets. That's how it works. Yeah? However, what happens from there is that all of the surplus that we create when we work for six hours so, uh, so, for example, when we work for six hours and we take back the equivalent of two hours' labour, those other four, four hours' labour, w whether you count it in money or however you count it, yeah, whether it's we create three yachts and take one, one home or whatever, what's happened is that there is a surplus that has been created yeah, and that surplus is no longer ours because through the manufacturing process, through the, the process of going to the office, we tell ourselves that it is not ours. We tell ourselves that we get what we are worth as a wage rather than what we've actually made. So we create a surplus, and that surplus is not ours. When that surplus gets to the level of the state, yeah, capitalists are not fooled the same way that we are over it. Capitalists fight over that surplus in a, in a very, um, a very all against all kind of way. Yeah? Now, within the um, w within the matter of elections, for example, you will find that uh, you will find like uh, Labour parties and Conservative parties and Liberal parties will all be representing certain sections of the economy, and whoever manages to you know, fight that out within the, the particular like year of that election, you know, whichever way the economy is going, basically that like, capitalist class as a whole throw open for us to to, to decide, but only within their terms. Yeah? But the point is, is that. This has nothing to do with us. Capitalism works for us on the scale that, uh, that John is saying, of like the free market capitalism. Yeah? But capitalism as a whole just basically creates a surplus which they then divide up according to rules that are not our own. And not the rules that uh, we're not the rules that we're told about. Okay. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill next and then Um sorry for shouting out earlier, um, but I, on a simple basis actually the example you gave of an academic textbook shows a, a very fundamental problem in capitalism. Uh, for the starters, the universities are private institutions which are paid a capitation fee by the government and they then add a top up fee from the individual studying there which derives the capitation, the capitation uh, by departments which is top sliced 
uh, for library book book buying. The costs of your academic textbook are derived from the costs of the typesetter, the editor, the proofreader, the managing director, and profits. Uh, whereas, once upon a time, the publishers uh, were riding the crest of a technological wave by making books available um, across the entire continent, where knowledge was very scarce. Nowadays, they have to make their profits by withholding uh, textbooks and knowledge and making it very hard to get hold of, partly by charging large uh, fees based on the rent of copyright. Uh, and th when, when in fact the transmission cost is virtually nil. I mean, either they could put it on the interweb and it would be really nil, or the, the actual cost of printing is entirely marginal to that. So when you go to the shops and pay uh, 50 pounds or 90 pounds for an academic textbook, almost all of that is the labour of the, into the intellectual labour that put it together. And in fact, the way that one of the things they'll do is they've probably only printed 100 copies of your textbook, uh, or, a very, or a very short run like that. I don't know. <laughs> Between 100 and 500, it's not long to do. Um, and they get very annoyed when they have to give six away to the copyright library, they have to give you ten to give to your friends, uh, and you know, they, really, they only have about 70 to sell in the end, and they have to make a profit out of that. Um, but they, they, there is good news in the end, because Richard says his, his local library doesn't stock it, but for a very small fee, they are legally obliged to obtain a copy one of the copies that the publisher had to give away. So in fact, if you went to your local library and asked for it, the entirely non-market mechanism would obtain it for you, even though it's not there. So there is a happy end to this, this story. But I think it, it, it illustrates a problem with capitalism that the, 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 the market has, in fact, held back technology in much the same way as Bolton and Watt's uh, patent on the steam engine held back the development of the steam engine for around about 70 years. Yes, I'd be uh, interested to know how uh, uh, the supporter of uh, capitalism would respond to uh, some of these points. I'm sure uh, nearly everybody in this room, if not everybody, remembers the collapse of the Soviet Union at the end of the uh, 1990s. And most people agreed that the collapse of that system uh, was, uh, or at least we would interpret it as being this, the collapse of state capitalism. Uh, the failure of a capitalism which was predominantly uh, run uh, by the state. Well, just as that uh, <coughs> event proved to be historical, the events of the last uh, six to uh, 12 months have shown the failure of another of uh, the aspects of capitalism, the failure of a predominantly private capitalism, which has been, uh, which had of course been uh, the tendency for uh, which capitalism had been going globally uh, since probably about uh, the middle of uh, the, the 70s. Uh, the fact that the state has now had to uh, creep in to bail out these private capitalists which our uh, libertarian uh, alliance people are, are, are so lauding. Incidentally, uh, they don't, unlike our uh, supporter of capitalism here tonight, they don't all uh, believe in uh, a continued existence of the state. Uh, many of them uh, would like to see uh, the state abolished completely so that uh, all we're left to is the laws of the jungle uh, form of, uh, of private capitalism. And getting uh, around to the laws of the jungle, uh, let's have a look at some of the consequences of private capitalism. The capitalist holocaust. Now, we all know about uh, the Nazi holocaust and uh, the monstrous consequences of that between 1939 and 1945. Uh, six million Jews died and millions of people in the Second World War, etc. What people are perhaps not so well aware of is the continuing capitalist, free market, free market holocaust, in which it's been calculated that on a, uh, average about 30 million people are dying globally uh, uh, per year through um, uh, preventable uh, diseases, through lack of access to clean uh, drinking water, etc. 
whereas uh, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Committee has, uh, has shown four years that we could support at least seven times the existing world's population if the economy were organised on humane, non-profit making uh, basis. And of course, you ain't ever going to get that under uh, a free market uh, economy or under a capitalism of, of any uh, sorts. So um, I'd be interested to know how uh, our supporter of capitalism apologises for uh, the capitalist uh, holocaust. And what the uh, uh, capitalist supporters also don't tell you, they never tell you about the recession after next. None of these mainstream politicians or supporters of, uh, of capitalism <coughs> tell you about that. They all say, oh yes, in a couple of years time the economy will be on the up and then we'll have a boom. Then we never hear about the next recession that's going to come along. Uh, and the point is that free market capitalism or capitalism run uh, by the state has got absolutely nothing to uh, offer the world's population. It's been one colossal failure and the, the capitalist holocaust, the inequalities, and bear in mind that these people have been suffering under a global economy, economy of capitalism, which goods can be transported to save their lives if the will were there. But of course these people have not got the money. They don't, for the market, they just don't count. So we need to look round for an alternative. And I'm glad to say that there is an alternative to this market madness, and that is the alternative of uh, production for human need. No money, no profits, human beings first. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if I could just say that I enjoyed the debate, and I agree with sentiments that you're expressing, so sort of Richard's point with regard to your commitment to abolishing poverty, hunger, malnutrition, is evils of starvation. I entirely agree with that. But is it not the case, or am I wrong, that countries like India or China, South America, billions of people moving out of those terrible conditions for the growth of performance, jobs and business? I'll just respond to that briefly, but I want to point out to my statistics uh, about the major undernourishment in the world. It goes down in periods and then it surges up again because capitalism can't touch those problems. Relief comes in pockets to some and then others get the thin end of the wedge. Of course, um, you look at China, which is one fifth of the world's population, when a lot of the statistics about the um, diminishment of figures, say, of undernourishment, they are related to China, where there's been a massive industrial upsurge. Um, and and um, so, again, the figures aren't entirely reliable. The point I make is that, you know, capitalism has had a chance. When I was growing up, it promised time and time and time again that only when it did reach the pinnacle of production, when it was did have the technology to deliver these things, that is what would happen. In fact, we see it is exactly what not has not happened. It has happened in certain places. It has not happened in other places. And in many of the places it has happened, I regret to say, there were economic and power political reasons. Does that mean that capitalism isn't bad, but it's our moral view on the world and how we interact with it? <coughs> Sorry? Does what you just said, does that mean that capitalism isn't fundamentally bad? It's the way we use it that we no, don't... We not don't, at all. That we not don't. at all. I've already said that the, the mechanism of capitalism cannot solve these problems because it is based upon the need for profit. What about capitalism with a moral viewpoint? <laughs> 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 Of course there are Catholics. Of course there are Catholics. There are Catholics as well. Of course there are. Of course there are. Only a fool would say they were. But I'm saying that those ethics are impossible 
to come to fruition in a system based upon profit and the exploitation of most people. But the sale of capitalist who gives away 95% of my profits to the workers who work for me, isn't that a moral view on the methods of the own work? I've got some friends who ran businesses who shared their profits. They were still within the system. They still did not touch the kind of figures. How can we live in a world where so many millions don't have access to So your, your problem is with human nature. Ah, now. <laughs> am I going to deal with that now? <laughs> Maybe I'll deal with it in the summing up. <laughs> That's good, I want to deal with that. I'll answer that. And I'll come in, Chairman. Um, the uh, speaker for capitalism said something, I thought that he said early on, that Marx didn't say much about capitalism, which I thought was a little bit strange, and maybe I misheard him. But uh, his definition of capitalism a relationship between wage labour and capital. So he gave a very precise uh, definition of capitalism. Now we always recognise that capitalism has played a useful role in, in human development. It played the, the role that the quest for profit was the, uh, the, the motive for engine that, that uh, um, fueled the uh, ability to mass produce you, you know, for fantastic um, uh, ability things and sell things, make things for sale. But it got to a point where that very quest for profit is now acting as a feta, which is stopping progress. Now, the friend over here said about the production in China and India, the, is, um, the, this production there is, is <coughs> lifting people out of poverty. But you have to look at, at what is happening, what they've <laughs> joined this, this treadmill, but what are they making? These factories are being moved from one part of the world to another uh, part of the world, and a, a lot of the, the stuff that's being made, you know, I mean, there, there are several different um, colours of, of uh, washing up liquid, the, you know, a fantastic amount of things. Um, a manufacturer of wants and, and needs just to, because of this necessity to keep producing for, for sale. The, the market's got to keep expanding or, or it's, not, uh, it's not working. Um, now what we suggest is that the, the people who, who do all of this, this work, and as someone else pointed out that uh, you know, if capitalism <coughs> is worked by workers, that it shouldn't be done for this, um, for the profit motive. We should do it on our own behalf. It's, it's the, not an ethical matter, it's the material interest of, of those who do all of the work to abolish capitalism and to take the political action to do so, so that we actually produce necessary things, useful things, and reduce them just to be used and not to be sold at a profit. Because um, someone mentioned common ownership. But common ownership means that not only do we own the means of production, but own the things that commonly own the things that are produced. And the equality that we want is the equal right of free access to what is produced. And that it just doesn't mean, you know, that the person's got a larger person has got to eat a small meal because they've got to have an equal amount of food. It's the equal right of free access to what is produced. That's the, that's the equality that, that we want. And as I say, it's the capitalism has played its part, but it's now standing in the way of, of the progress of the human race to have a, a, a world really fit for human beings. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to underline the question that Pat asked, that uh, uh, John Meadowcroft says that, uh, if I understood him right, uh, M Marx didn't define capitalism. Um, but what Marx did was describe the process of capitalist production. And, you know, in the very first chapter of, of Capital, he he, he says capitalist society is the society where the wealth takes the form of 
and it's the, the basis of immense accumulation of commodities. And then he goes on to analyze what the commodity is, because that's the basic <coughs> unit of, of capitalist production. And capitalism is commodity production because it's also uh, um, it's also a, a society of class ownership. So capitalism for Marx, I think, could be summed up as uh, class ownership and commodity production. And in contrast to that, socialism would be a society of common ownership and production for use. In other words, there wouldn't be prices and markets in, in, a, so, in a socialist society. Now, if capitalism, uh, so if Marx didn't define capitalism, John Medecroft, as far as I could hear, didn't define socialism. And possibly, in his summing up, he, he, he might do that for us. But from what he said, the, the implication of what he said and, and what I got out of it was that his view of socialism was really capitalism with a specialist class of planners <coughs> plan the markets and plan prices and so on. Uh, but for us, that, that's not socialism. That, that is simply another, another form of, of capitalism. And my final point is, is the, the, the point uh, uh, John Medicroft made about non-market economies <coughs> being more unequal than market economies. Did I, did I understand that right? That's what you said. That non-market economies are more unequal. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. So in, in that case, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. Oh, Jim, about that. Yeah, feeling a bit tired now. I'm thinking about down to the pub. Um, just a couple of whimsical remarks. Gentleman over there, um, a very generous chap who's only given ninety-five percent of his profits as a businessman to to the staff and to the workers. Well, I think under the theory of surplus value, standing with my friend Danny, he'd have to give that extra five percent, would he not? No, no, so that's a bad job for okay. <laughs> <laughs> the business, I mean, I, I read in the Defender the other day about reference to Mr. Blair, you know, that man who caused push more privatisation than, than the market fetch ever did, and he said he was in a half child poverty by 2010, and he's going to yeah. abolish it completely under 2020. Well, I don't think there's much chance of that, is there? And uh, the other comment about human nature is one that's always puzzled me. Um, because I see people behaving differently in all sorts of different ways. I know people who give their blood in this country um, for, no, for no financial reward. They do it. And some people work for charities for no financial reward. These are some aspects of human nature that are not talked about in this sort of arena. Well, it's very really part talked about, it, of course. Um, but the thing about human nature is, how can we say that every French person has the same ideas? How can we say that every... English person has the same ideas. Every big, somebody, Burkina Faso has the same ideas. You know, there's lots of malleability in human nature. So I don't think there's a fixed idea of human nature. And people threaten to become protected. Well, we're certainly threatened every day. I'm not threatened of losing our jobs. We've got quite some other production at the moment. I have spoken about this. But loads of workers run out of work, not because they're inefficient, but there's too many cars being produced on the market that can't be bought. It's been one of the amazing paper now. Uh, I'd like to refer back to what you said earlier on in your, in your opening uh, section when you talked about you need like workers like to produce a cake and more workers you've got the biggest cake. I mean something, something along those lines. Well, I mean I've been a worker all my life and I spent the first 10 years of my life working in every construction, steel wheels, um, power stations, that kind of thing. And when I went to work, I and mean, every day I went to work, we were always scheming to try and to do the job as easy as possible. It's hard, difficult, irksome <coughs> work, uncomfortable work. <coughs> and when I look at that, I'm amazed, I'm absolutely amazed that this, this unbelievably embarrassing system can sort of like come unnoticed in that a good capitalism, an economic, an economic system. Well, I mean, if you sort of trace it back to the, to the Greek, it, 
in, in economics, means like housekeeping. It's the most absurd way <coughs> of keeping house because capitalism is a commercial society, a market society. It throws up consequences that have to be dealt with. So in the market economy, you've got bank insurance, taxation, advertising, money, debt, you've got to have police, prisons, the law, armies, navies, air forces, military, industrial complex. You've got to have gambling, industry, stock exchange, stock jumpers, stock brokers. You've got to have and just customs and exercise, trading stands, people working on checkouts, people in market, people in, in sales. Now, all this work is absolutely essential to capitalism. They have one thing in common, not one scrap of it produces any food, clothing, shelter, medicine, education, art, music, dance, sport, literature, none of that. All this work does is essential to capitalism. It just keeps keeps the wheels of capitalism rolling. It the profits rolling in. Now, the joke about this is it's been estimated that it absorbs around 80% of all social effort. But that means that there's only 20% of us producing food, clothing, shelter, medicine, etc. If it was 50%, which is far greater than that, far, far less than that, it would still be the embarrassing scandal. Now, what the Socialist Party put forward is you abandon all that useless, unnecessary talk. And what you do is instead of just 20% available to do this useful, necessary work producing these really human goods and services that are essential for fulfilment, You've got 100% of the survival. Now, that would be two things. One, nobody would have to volunteer to turn up for more than a couple of days' work away doing something socially creative, something productive. Secondly, instead of producing all the tab and the shoddy, the capitalism has produced stuff that is on the wear out, the breakdown, become obsolete, that's been made over and over and over again. There'll be no reason for us to produce anything other than the very best of it. Stuff that is beautiful, stuff that was well made, stuff that would last, stuff that would be repaired, stuff that we could pass on. So we could be ecologically, ecologically sustainable. And so what we find ourselves in, then, we find ourselves in a situation if that, if that, if that 20, 28% spread is correct, it's four times more expensive in a commercial society to sell something than it is to make. And consequently, we're so busy taking care of business. We don't take care of them, we can't take care of ourselves. And secondly, and I must, I must make this point because I think it's very important. Every society that's ever sustained itself over any historical period has always had to have like a, a worldview, a way of interpreting the world, a way of understanding the world, and the way the individual understands the world and their place in it. So we've had the worldview of hunt gatherer society, the worldview of chattel slavery society, the worldview of feudalism, but now capitalism or Market. Now, this psychology, if that's what you want to call it, the mass psychology of the market, states this. It says that the more you have, the more you've been able to take, and the market isn't fuzzy how you've taken it. You could be an illegal arms dealer or a legal arms dealer, for all that matter, a drug dealer, a child pornographer, a people trafficker, or an armed robber. And if you have the money and you have it in sufficient amounts, the market will satisfy your wants. But on the other hand, if you are living in some poverty stricken part of the world and you're in dire straits, you and your family are starving, go seriously without, and the market is the outlet for what you need, you go to the market, but if you have no money, the market doesn't recognise your existence. So this psychologist says the more you have, the more you are, but the less you have, the less you are. And we in our society today cannot refute it because it's all around us, and we all think like it to a certain extent. The more you have, the more you are. Unless you have. Our humanity is gauged by the size of our shell portfolio and our bank account. Now that has to be inhuman. It's obscene, it's obnoxious, and it's repellent. Yeah. 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 I hear a couple of here years just after this flamboyant remark. Right here. I'm not a party member. I came here as a neutral observer. And I must say I'm slightly disappointed by the tone of the discussion. John came here obviously knowing he comes into the lion's den to defend in front of a predominantly socialist party of Great Britain membership audience, capitalism must be very great. Whether he has made a good case or not, in my view he has got a quite a good case 
to suggest that capitalism in the form we enjoy it in Europe is the best of possible worlds. What I very much regret is that it was then constantly implied that he doesn't show compassion for the shortcomings of capitalism. If that's the main drift of your argument, that he doesn't care about the misery in Africa or in this country, I think you have made not a good case to weaken his suggestion. I specifically said in my talk that I respected the fact yeah, that that. Richard, I specifically said that. Yeah. I accept you from my criticism. I meant the members of the audience, where there was a lot of this. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Does anyone else want to come in before the uh, people start speaking again? The United States is a tripartite, totalitarian dictator. Press, elected, and financial. As a result of which, the IMO and the World Bank tells you what to do. Does not matter if you have a conservative government or labor government? Tell it in your legs, you let it do it. That's your democracy. That's your sovereignty. That's your independence. Okay. Um, hi, it's Mr. Reinhardt. Um, if John walks out of here, we like him. <laughs> uh, I say if you walk out of here, we like him. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to speak about was uh, human nature. Um, it's been raised from the fact that uh, you know, sort of capitalism is about human nature or whatever. The point is, is that capitalism is actually an absence of human nature. Capital. Uh, yeah, we talk about capital as a social relationship, yeah, because it's the way we relate to each other. But really, what it is, it's the absence of a social relationship. What it is, is not having to talk to a person. It's not having to make a social relationship in regards to um, uh, access to goods or to working or whatever. What capital is, is it is the equivalent of raising a child in a room cupboard. Yeah. Capital yeah, yeah. is basically living a life without any kind of social relationships as to uh, as to how we proceed. So, so how we organise our economy is basically on a war of all against all, not because that is what an economy is, but because that is what our economy has been reduced to. We have had our social relationships removed from our ways of working. We live in a world where we are devoid of our, uh, of our social relationships. And where those show up, for example, I mean, a, a classic example, for example, would have been the miners' strike in 1984, where uh, that was driven not necessarily by a uh, sort of yeah, communistic uh, drive towards uh, world socialism or anything, but just by uh, sort of like remaining uh, social remaining social relations of production that were being destroyed by Thatcherism. Yeah? So in, in, in reality, that minor strike, for example, could be seen negatively as um, sort of workers trying to stay, not, not go past capitalism, but stay out of capitalism, but to just try and stay behind that curve. Now, what we are talking about is we are talking about a, a society that no, not only is capitalism a disastrous way uh, financially to work. I mean, we can explain how um, sort of like financially capitalism only uses a few percent of our actual labor for useful production. Everything else goes into law courts, goes into uh, armed forces, etc., etc., etc. It goes down the line. Uh, you can compile those math mathematics. But really, long term, we should be more concerned about the fact that we do not want to live in a society that is based around a lie. 
that is based around the idea that we have no relationship to each other when we interact with each other. Because working is how we interact with each other. It's, so it, it's the majority of our lives, the majority of our social lives. Yeah? So if we, in, our, in the majority of our lives, and in all of our productive lives, if we behave as if we do not exist to each other, as if we are only objects to each other, then we destroy ourselves. We kill ourselves in the process of production. Yeah? And that, for socialists, is as important, if not more so, than the physical business of whether we would be more or less rich. We can demonstrate the fact that we, as, <coughs> that we as a class, would be wealthier. That is easy to do, just by showing the fact that we are exploited as a class and we could take those resources back and cease to be exploited and we would be better off uh, economically. However, it then goes on for socialists to demonstrate that also, when it comes to arguments about, say, that human nature, about the argument that there is no alternative to the market, that we are all sort of like uh, objects to each other to be destroyed, it falls to us as socialists also to demonstrate that we could live in a much better world by actually relating to each other as human beings and as a society as we produce. So not only would, be, would we be richer in resources, we'd also be qualitatively richer as a society. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else um, need to speak now? Because I think we've reached the point of winding up. Um, just like to thank you all for a collection of £71.72, thanks. And to draw your attention to a day score which the party will be holding on the um, Saturday, the 2nd of May in Clapham. And there, there are various other meetings which are listed in our journal of social standard, which amongst other things, this is the latest issue, amongst other things are on the sale of back. Um, okay, Danny, are you reminding me of something? No, I'm just not speaking of possible. Well, I think, yeah. perhaps, sorry, I think, okay, I'll try to do it afterwards, to do it individually. Um, now we're just going to wind up for our party and then job. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to try and answer your point once more. Had this title of this debate been, should there be a future for socialism, then I would have spoken first and talked about common ownership, democratic control, etc., etc., etc. As it was, it was, should there be a future for capitalism? And my job was to try and show what was wrong with his argument, not primarily what was right with mine, and secondly, Secondly, I am not of the school that believes that every single Socialist Party meeting, the Speaker has to specifically go over those same fundamentals time and time and time again until people are bored to tears. Yeah, You've yeah, heard, yeah. From the, heard from the audience, it's quite evident, everybody here knows the most fundamental things that we stand for, and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk to those afterwards who don't, which in my opinion, is the best way. <coughs> of course, unfortunately, I couldn't have a chance to challenge you on the view of democracy, which I also read on your web things, um, which you seem to associate with socialist control. And that ain't what we think about democracy. What we mean is complete free dissemination of information, the absence of the state, no secret cliques, etc., and free communication. Now, I do want to deal mainly here with this point raised about human nature and touch on that. It's a very important point indeed. As socialists, we tend to talk about human behavior rather than human nature. For well, what is human nature? I may be capable of the most noble acts like giving away 95% of my income to my workers. I may be capable of the most basic acts by taking nearly 100% away from them. Uh, it depends on who I am, what I am, what my needs <coughs> are, and what my own values are. It's often said, what if someone in socialism wants four Rolls Royces? <laughs> and the answer is, if we approach the problem with that attitude of mind, we won't be in socialism. It's as simple as that. We will not get there if that is the attitude of mind prevailing in society. 
Although, I should say, if there were old voices and they were freely available, then they're welcome to them as far as I'm concerned, because I can't drive. And by that time, I should be the only male European without a plump foot. <laughs> now, the thing about human nature, you see, we have, in the Socialist Party, a great regard for rationality and reason. And the rational ego, for us, is a vital part of human development often neglected. And when you get angry and talk about the figures I've mentioned tonight, often sometimes your rational ego does get a bit disoriented. A hopeful thing about the human society and about behaviour is that on the evolutionary scale, we're facing, we're still puking babies. We know bugger all really. We think we know so much. And we think that because we make the classic mistake in philosophy of failing to distinguish between knowledge and wisdom, two very different things. And alas, the one in our society has totally outstripped the other. Rational and irrational behaviour are so often dependent on particular circumstances. The old thing they used to ask at the conscientious objection board. What would you do if your child or your grandmother was being raped by a Russian or a German soldier? And of course, nobody can answer that question. Uh, I used to have a friend who, when he was accused of being too rational, used to say, well, I can't be bloody rational in my armchair. What chance have I got? Because, of course, the, re the reason they asked that question, it was another trick. They were putting your rational ego into an imaginary, highly unlikely, irrational situation and looking for a rational answer. We have all of us fallible human beings. We've all been in situations where sometimes we haven't acted as we wish we hadn't done. When we haven't acted as rationally as we wish we hadn't done. Rational and irrational situations, how we are at the time we are in them or observe them all have a part to play in this. And of course, much irrational behaviour does stem from the terrible plight uh, caused by economic determinism, which is present in our society. It's a real problem, because when the values of society are put down as wealth, property, money, financial security, people living in an insecure world, in which their house could be taken tomorrow if the interest rates change, in which their job could be lost. Today it's common to have in the day of a 40-year 40 40 mortgage a six-month <coughs> contract, if you're lucky, not knowing what's going to happen next. This has filled people, and it's a capitalist trick, filled them with a terrible sense of insecurity and unsafety. They don't feel safe to look outside capitalism for an answer. So they are trapped within its boundaries of profit making, internal profit making. I'll just finish with this. Uh, I've told this story to some comrades before, but I have to believe it's a very outside one. One of my favourite actors is James Garner, most underrated actor. And he made a marvellous film called Support Your Local Show. This is about human nature. And there were these real thugs and their dad. And he rounds them up, you see, and he puts them in the jail. And then he goes into the cell and draws this chalk line. He says, right, these are the bars, this is the wall, I don't care about those. If you cross over this chalk line, I cannot be responsible for the consequences. A long speech, he sights them up. Their dad comes, he pulls down the wall, he pulls down the railings. Come on! And they stand there, quivering. We can't, why not? The line, the line. Think about a different world in which there is a, a free exchange of goods and there is no money. We can't, we can't. The line, the mortgage. It's this terrible fear, the worst thing that capitalism has done is take away the belief that we can change the world. 
That is the last great illusion that every single one of us has conquered. We may never be able to change capitalism, but we can with the dynamics of human development and the depths of human consciousness, damn well change the way we live. Yeah. 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 Yeah.